teaching children science with Kelly Hargrave. Yes, there are sharks. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week, we look at teaching children science. We're going to be speaking with National Geographic's Kelly Hargrave about her new book, Can't Get Enough Shark Stuff. Sharks! Children are natural scientists. The questions which may seem tedious to some parents. Why is the sky blue? What are the stars? Why do we have belly buttons? We feel science to be hardwired into the human mind. Far too often, however, natural curiosity is squelched and discouraged by society as a whole. Children often find their questions brushed aside by adults, all too often caught up in the daily tribulations of media celebrities and the soap opera of state. At the same time, our race stands at the precipice of massive potential dangers, ranging from nuclear war to pandemics to catastrophic climate change. Perhaps our best hope for the future is to educate young people, some of whom will become the scientists of the future. In order to do this, however, the light of science in children must be constantly fed by education, inquiry, and play. Octopuses! If we hope to engage with as many young people as possible, learning should be as enjoyable and engaging as it could be. Each child is different, holding on to their own interests and questions about the universe. Encouraging innate interests could provide us our best hope at developing young scientists. While Eugene from Oregon is fascinated by the moon, Madison from Wisconsin might have her room full of toys and posters featuring sharks. Sharks! Now we're going to talk with children's science author Kelly Hargrave about her new book, Can't Get Enough Shark Stuff from National Geographic. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Kelly Hargrave. She is an author of numerous science books for children, and she is the author of Can't Get Enough Shark Stuff, out from National Geographic. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to dive into sharks. Oh, I love that. So, first of all, why sharks? What, what makes them so interesting for you? Oh, gosh, for me and for everyone, it's just I think that they just have this amazing presence, right? They're this mysterious creature. They live underwater, which is so different from creatures that are on land. Um, but there's also over 500 species of sharks. So I think we all generally have the same idea and the same shark that we kind of picture in our head, usually something like a great white. But to know that there are over 500 different species of sharks, I mean, we're really working with a lot of material here to pull out some really cool things. So in this book, we've showed a variety of sharks. You can turn page to page and see a different shark on every page with a cool superpower. So we're really hoping it's going to be really engaging and mind-blowing for kids. Wow. So why is it that kids love sharks so much? Is it the same thing or is it their innate interest in science or? Yeah, why? I think it's so, they, they look so different again, like than what we have on land. And I just think that that fierceness, there's something fearless about them. They're extreme hunters, you know, they just, they do really well at what they do. And I think kids enjoy that. They like seeing them in their element. It's a different element than what they're used to. And of course, that kind of like scary factor brings a little mystery to it, a little intrigue. It makes you just want to dive a little bit deeper under the surface and learn more about what is really going on down there that's so different than what's going on on land. So I think that's part of it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, nature in general, but especially the oceans are a place where, well, Pretty much everything eats everything else. <laughs> so, so why is it that sharks terrify us in a way that a lot of other ocean animals might not? It's the teeth. <laughs> I just go out and say it. 
<laughs> uh, if I'm being honest, you know, it's the drives, but you know, like we have a whole spread in the book that actually um, compares and contrasts all the, like a lot of different jaws and teeth that are happening in shark mouths. And there's a lot of variants um, from, I don't know if you've checked out the book yet, but the Wait. wob gong shark has flat molar teeth. And it's this crazy looking shark that kind of looks like a rug. Um, it has these splotches and it can kind of camouflage in to the ground below it. And then it also has these tassels to make it look like coral. So it kind of blends in. And then when, when something swims above it, it can pounce and eat it. Um, but it has these flat teeth compared to other sharks where it can hold onto that prey sometimes for days at a time until that prey just kind of gives in and finally stops wiggling. So talk about some perseverance with some sharks for sure. Oh my God, that is, that is like cruel and unusual punishment. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the, the tassels aren't, you know, just sort of a country Western 70s throwback decorative thing, man, right? No, no, I don't think that they know what that is. But, <laughs> but yes, it's, it's so cool how some of these sharks evolved to kind of start looking like their surroundings. They've really, you know, taken on pieces that make them extreme, wonderful hunters and good at what they do. So yeah, they, that looks like, to other fish, so they'll be curious, like, oh, let's go look at that coral, ah, shark, you know, so yeah, it's, it's pretty entertaining, and that's just one shark, you know, that's one cool shark that a lot of kids probably haven't even heard of, um, so, you know, that's just one of many that we have in the book. All right, and so what do you, what for you do you think is the, let's go to the opposite extreme, what for you is the, is the cutest shark out there? Oh, gosh. Well, I can I can um, discuss two with you that I really like that Please, really, really run the game. Yeah, yeah, just two cute shirts. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm going to throw out there the dwarf lantern shirt. It's actually a really small shark. It's the tiniest shark that's out there. Um, and it can be the length of a number two pencil, which um, how can a shark be that small? Most people would think it was just a, a normal fish, but it is actually considered a shark and it has some really cool superpowers. It actually has these little spots on its stomach that will light up and glow. So they use this to um, lure in prey Fish will be swimming by and they'll leave the glow in the distance and they'll think it's food for them. So they'll come closer to the shark, not knowing there's a shark then, and then they get pounced. Um, but they can also use that light to also camouflage itself against the, the sunlight that drips through um, the surface of the water. So it kind of goes a couple of different ways. And then another cute shark is the biggest shark, which is the whale shark. Um, it's considered a gentle giant. You know, it's never attacked a human. It actually eats really tiny creatures like grill and plankton, plankton and shrimp. And it's actually one of the coolest sharks that people have been able to swim with because it, it's, it's a gentle giant. So that's, that would be a really cool experience. You can swim with them off the Great Barrier Reef and things like that, which is neat. And they're really cute and, of course, have been in some famous movies. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so um, just curious, and, you know, I actually did, I, I always, you know, read through the books and I, I absolutely love this one. And um, so, you know, one thing did kind of scare me in that, shark Kano. Shark, shark what? The, the shark volcano off. Oh, it's the shark volcano, yes. <laughs> Tell us about the shark volcano. <laughs> yeah, this is not a made up movie. Shark volcano is real. <laughs> um, so basically, some scientists kind of suspected that there was some interesting stuff happening um, near this underwater volcano. So they sent in a robot to see what was going on. And they were super surprised to see that there were sharks living at underwater close to the base of this volcano, which is, they weren't expecting to find anything, honestly, because water, the water around um, underwater volcanoes is very acidic and very hot. It's a very hostile environment for mm -hmm. anything to live in. So, you know, it's really hard to research um, environments like this just because they're so dangerous. It's, it's an active volcano. So you have to kind of be paying attention to what's happening in your surroundings to safely be able to study it. Um, but yeah, that's amazing. They found, um, I believe, um, silky sharks and then also um, a type of hammerhead species there. And I'm sure that they can't wait to try and get some more research on how those sharks evolved to be able to survive in those atmospheres. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a movie with Samuel L. Jackson coming up here in the near future. <laughs> oh, that, I mean, I'm sure it would be entertaining, you know. <laughs> I'm sure it would. So kids, like I said, as we've said, are natural scientists. How do, how do books like, like this teach them 
about bio, let's say biology, conservation, as well as general science. Yeah, so, you know, in, in a book like this, where we're just covering like one specific animal, um, we're trying to show all the fun facets of it, but we're also trying to show how it has an impact on the, the greater world. So, you know, something like a shark is an apex predator. And as we all know, in science, an apex predator is the ruler of their environment, you know, everything that they do trickles down to everything else. So one example of that is that, um, you know, sharks are big, um, they actually hold a lot of carbon within them, but they also help regulate carbon around them. And um, as we know, carbon, if it's released, if too much of it is released, it can have an effect on global warming. And of course, we don't want that to happen. So we want sharks to stay safe. We don't want them to die too often because then they're releasing the carbon that's in their giant bodies. But then we also want them to be able to scare away those critters that feed on things like seagrass that also hold carbon um, so that they're not being overly eaten and really releasing too much of that into the atmosphere. So things as small as sharks or, you know, they're not small, but they're just one animal can have an impact on the greater planet and our daily lives, which is pretty incredible um, to know how vast science is. If that's just one animal's impact. <laughs> right, right. That's amazing. Yeah. And so where, where are some of the, some other things that, you know, the study of sharks and, you know, marine life in general can help teach us about, about the climate and What's going yes, on? well, about the climate, um, we also have um, sharks are also a big defender of coral reefs, um, which are very important to help with erosion um, on our coastlines and keeping keeping our coast safe, but also regulating the different types of animals that feed on all the different things that are happening on coral reefs. But also going back to the, um, to the volcano that we were talking about, exploring environments like that and seeing how animals survive in really harsh environments like that can actually open our eyes to when we're thinking about going into space and researching what the potential of life on other planets and what could exist in atmospheres. And I'm sure you've talked about this before, but yeah, those types of atmospheres, including like things like the Mariana Trench, you know, people need to study those to just be able to open our imaginations to what's possible across the universe, which I think is really neat. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. Um, we actually just recently had Sylvia Earle on the show talking, of, talking about how oceans, what oceans can teach us about other worlds. Um, so when we go out to these ocean worlds, notably Europa orbiting Jupiter, um, or Enceladus orbiting uh, Saturn, we, if we were to find some sort, naturally, from, if we were to find some sort of higher life on the order of, let's say, sharks. <laughs> yeah. You know, what, what, is, what are the life plans, the body plans that have developed here that might be useful to animals there. Well, I think that, you know, when we think about things in space, we always think about maybe seeing some kind of big creature, an alien, but I think um, it's more likely that we're going to end up finding some kind of microbe or smaller little creature that's feeding on, you know, some extreme different bacteria that we've never heard of. So smaller creatures, I think focusing on those and seeing how they interact and thrive, because those are, you know, those are, we have millions of those types of things on our planet, which barely get talked about. But those microbes and little, mm -hmm. little creatures are the ones that are really going to blow our minds. And those are the ones that are really kind of at the forefront of some of that research. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Yeah. And so what has made sharks? Sharks have been around a long, long time, a, lot, a whole lot longer than us. What, what makes sharks so successful? Oh, my gosh. Well, yeah, they're just like the king of adapting, right? They've been on the planet for over 400 million years, which a lot of people like to say that's longer than the dinosaurs. So, you know, sharks have been around for a really long time. And I think with that time, they've been able to hone their skills over and over again. And I think that's why we see so much variety within the 500 species that are still here. Um, we have a whole spread in the book about 
Um, we actually have a couple of spreads in the book about the megalodon, which um, is the most notorious prehistoric shark that lived um, over three million years ago. And it's like the great, great, great grandfather of the great white. It's double the size of the great white. Yikes. Mm -hmm. um, so, but learning about things like the megalodon and finding their teeth, you know, can help open our worlds to understanding like, what was the earth like back then? What were they dealing with the, the extremes to get them to where they are today? So um, I think a lot of people, when they think about paleontology, they think about dinosaurs, but to know that sharks are in the mix with that study, I think can be really appealing to kids. Um, it's a difficult job because um, unlike dinosaurs, sharks don't have bones, they're made of cartilage. So that can make it really hard to track down fossils. Um, that's why their teeth are that, that much more important to scientists. <laughs> so for young kids now who are, you know, who want to be scientists, um, what, is, what are some of the bigger questions or what are some of the more interesting questions we still have about sharks? What, what can these kids spend their lives studying the answer to? Oh my gosh. Well, you know, I think to begin with, there's so many sharks um, that live so deep in the ocean that we've we haven't had many sightings of them. And because of that, um, there's still a lot to be studied. I think it's the Greenland shark, um, which can live up to a couple of hundred years, which is incredible. We're starting to learn that it might be the longest living vertebrae on the planet. Um, which is really exciting. But again, you know, as technology starts to move forward, we can dive a little bit deeper to hopefully be able to catch some of these more mysterious sharks. So that's something to look forward to, to know that there's still a lot to learn about a lot of the species that are out there. But it's also really cool to know that we're still discovering new sharks. Um, just within the last decade, we found something called the American pocket shark. It's a smaller shark, small enough to fit in your pocket. Um, <laughs> but it's along really with tiny. the number two pencil? Yes, I think yes, and that, along with that, you know, I got both <laughs> things that are real priorities in my life. <laughs> um, but the American pocket shark is really awesome because it creates this glowing goo outside of it um, that attracts prey. They might use it to communicate, but again, like, you know, this glowing goo, it extracts it from its body. We haven't had many opportunities to study it. What, what is it? How does it do it? Where does it come from? What is it really trying to communicate and who with? Those are the types of questions that we're asking when we discover sharks and these neat little, you know, superpowers that they have. That's fabulous. And finally, for any young sci budding scientists out there, what, what words of advice do you have for them? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, if anything ever piques your interest, I would just say dive a little bit deeper. You know, we have so many things around us and each each thing has a has a story to tell. So if you if you find something that's interesting, I bet you you'll find 10 thing 10 things more interesting if you just do a little more research. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is just to use your curiosity as a map. You know, it's telling you what you're interested in and just follow that. Um, and, you know, there's still some like really amazing discoveries to be found in this earth. And I think that's the most exciting thing about being a scientist is being able to bring that to the world and show why and how it exists. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Kelly. It was fabulous talking with you. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me. Nice. And that was Kelly Hargrave, author of Can't Get Enough Shark Stuff. So head on out or head online and take a bite. The human race now stands at the precipice of the next great step in human evolution the permanent habitation of large numbers of human beings in outer space. Soon, for the first time in history, human habitations will rise above the surface of the moon and Mars. The explorers within these early interplanetary villages will face dangers unknown in our home world. In return, they will uncover wonders beyond the dreams of avarice. The first people to step foot on the ruddy surface of Mars are likely alive today, possibly coloring in conic sections in this book by Hop David, as you watch this video. Millions of years ago, distant ancestors of humans first began to come down out of the trees, forever shaping the future. Our current human migration into space will, for the very first time, 
protect our species from any planet-wide disaster. For the first time in nearly 75 years, the people of the world will not be held hostage by the ever-present threat of utter and complete extinction following a few hours of nuclear terror. The first families living on the moon and Mars will depend on people and equipment from many nations and organizations on Earth. Within decades, these interplanetary communes will be filled with large numbers of people, many of whom never once set foot on Earth. The trials and tribulations of short-sighted leaders on a distant world are likely to mean little to the real-life moon people and Martians of the near future. The exploration of space offers us our best opportunity to evolve past rampant nationalism and jingoistic fervor. Teaching children science also provides us our best hope for dealing with crises such as pandemics and global climate change. Science teaches young people to better evaluate global events and scientific claims popularized in media, both large and small. Perhaps we might even see fewer children traumatized by stories of alligators in toilets. Alligators! They weren't real. Join us next week on The Cosmic Companion as we look at the life and deaths of stars with astrophysicist Simone Scarlingi from the University of Durham about his recent discovery of micronovae, a type of supernova never before seen by astronomers. Please subscribe, follow, and share this show on all your favorite social media. If you have a hankering for more episodes, check out thecosmiccompanion.tv. Here's wishing everyone out there, especially our budding young scientists, clear skies.